and welcome back to Bug Rounds. On this channel we like to discuss all things creepy crawly, so if that's something that interests you, please consider subscribing to the channel. Now before I get onto this video I want to put up a little disclaimer. This is more based on my personal opinion and my personal review specifically on a leaflet that Pets at Home provide. This is a leaflet created by them. You've got the Pets at Home symbol in the bottom based on tarantulas. So first of all, how did I come about wanting to do this video? Well, I was contacted by a friend of mine who said that Pets at Home in our hometown are now currently doing inverts. So I was curious and went and had a look. They only actually had one LP in there, Lassiodora Parahabana Tarantula. Um, it wasn't kept right for starters. It was a very heavily overpriced small juvenile. Um, I'm not here to talk about prices though. You know, shops are shops, they're gonna be a bit more money. But it was kept on no more, no word of a lie here, no more than one centimeter of what looked like dry, hardened, balled up soil-based substrate. They did provide a water dish, however, and a hide, but the hide was half of a toilet roll tube. Now, for a species like an LP that requires a slightly moister substrate, using cardboard is a really bad idea. It's also a species that will create a burrow, especially at that younger age, and they have not provided it any means to be able to do so. But this is not the main point. I, I was That was bad enough as it is. But the bit I want to talk to you about is this leaflet. I came across this right by where the tarantula was and it's tarantula your guide to keeping them happy and healthy home of pet welfare pets at home now this is actually quite a long leaflet and there are a few little good points in here but some of the stuff i read really angered me now, i'm not going to read you the whole leaflet and bore you to death through this video so i'm going to pick out specific parts of this so it starts off, and this is important, an introduction to caring for tarantulas. So you want your new tarantula to be happy, and so do we, so we've put together this guide for caring for tarantulas. Handy, and this is important, if you already have tarantulas or thinking about getting one. So they're targeting both new keepers, brand, brand new keepers, or people that already have a few. Tarantulas make mesmerising and unusual companions are not all the scary, creepy crawlies that they're sometimes portrayed in in films. Now, I actually liked this part because it's better to respect the animal than fear it. They're fairly simple to care for, but are quite fragile. Again, a very, very good point until it says, so children should be supervised when handling them. Now, I'm not against handling as such, guys, but you've got to know how to do it right for the safety of yourself and your tarantula. There is nothing in this leaflet that explains the correct way to handle if you're going to. And it annoyed me because it's right at the start of this leaflet, it's already encouraging handling, right? Anyway, it moves on. It does explain that uh, females live older than males. Um, then we're gonna be more active at night, which might be a drawback to owners that wanna see their friends in action, right? Fair enough. Now, another important piece to remember through this video, it says tarantulas can be found in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, but most popular will come from South and Central America. So this company is very well aware that you have New World and Old World tarantulas. New World being the American side and Old World being the rest of the world. Now, if you're brand new to this channel, you may not realize there are quite a lot of differences between New World and Old World tarantulas. I'm not gonna get into it all on this video. A simple Google search will give you those answers. You can go back on some of my videos or you can go onto some other tarantula YouTuber videos to learn the differences. But there is a big difference, especially in defensive behavior, um, venom potency and general behaviors. So it's something you wanna look into if you're new. So these guys are well aware of this, okay? Then goes on to say that they will have different preferred habitats, whether that are boreal or terrestrial. Now they've also left out fossorial. So if somebody was to buy a fossorial species, a deep burrowing species, they're gonna have no information on this leaflet of how to keep that tarantula correctly. It's gonna cause it stress. If it's an old world that is stressed and cannot get its burrow, it's gonna be highly defensive of its territory. Um, it also says they should be around 30 centimetres long by 15 wide and 15 tall. And then it goes on to say that when they've grown up, they will want it up to 70 centimetres long, 
30 wide and 30 high. Now again, you also get dwarf species, guys. Our dwarf species that could only grow this big is never going to need a 30 centimeter high enclosure, okay? And in doing so, especially if it's a terrestrial, if it were to fall from the top of that enclosure, it could easily rupture its abdomen and die. But I mean, it's not the end of the world writing this. You do need some common sense as a keeper to figure those things out. Uh, it goes on here to say that they like it warm and cosy. Most tarantulas do, they're correct. So keep your vivarium's daytime temperature at 25C. Now, the reason they've put this is clearly a, a way of selling thermostats and heating equipment, okay? So you, there are many ways you can design your room about keeping the heat. You could have oiled filled radiators. You can put tarantulas that need it warmer, higher up. Tarantulas that like it a bit cooler, lower down because heat rises. Not every species from America, Africa, Asia is all going to need exactly 25C, right? And this is where things get a bit annoying. To heat your vivarium, use a ceramic lamp, heat mat, iridescent lamp, and connect it to appropriate thermostat. Why? <laughs> I don't know anybody using a ceramic lamp for their tarantula. I mean, it does go on to say, don't allow them to be in direct contact with the heating equipment, which is vital. But even so, a lot of people that might get tarantulas may have had snakes before or lizards where you have the heat mat underneath, okay? Tarantulas often will burrow to get away from the, the heat of the sun. They get their cooler patch underground. They don't want the heat source coming from directly from underneath the soil. If they burrow to the bottom and they lay on there, the glass gets too hot, for example, if it's in a glass tank, the tarantula will burn itself. Okay, not the smartest, I've seen it happen. It's horrible, okay? So they have not stated on there that if you wanted to use heat mats to maybe keep it an inch away from the enclosure on a wall or something, so that it's just giving general warmth rather than heating from underneath. Again, guys, this is just a way for them to make money and they are actually risking the tarantula's health because if you are brand new, you're gonna follow leaflets like this to a T, right? To a T, haha, <laughs> see what I did there, right? And then it goes on and gets even worse in this, guys. So to make your tarantula feel like they're in a favorite habitat, use some non-toxic artificial decor, blah, blah, blah. It just talks about decorating a tank. And it, you know, it talk, talks about bioactive setups too, which is pretty cool. But this is the bit that bothers me. Most tarantulas love to burrow, it says. So they are aware that there are fossorial species. Anyway, uh, so cover the floor in a suitable soil slash sand mixture. That's cool. And then it says, or well, you can consider using vermiculite or orchid bark or other suitable substrates. They are not suitable substrates. Having a little bit of vermiculite mixed in with your, your soil-based substrate is fine, but you can't use pure vermiculite. And you certainly can't use pure orchid bark or even have a full layer of orchid bark all the way along the top. They cannot burrow into that. All right, I know in the wild there's bits of bark everywhere. If somebody goes out and uses orchid bark purely as a substrate and it's just clumps upon clumps of wood, your tarantula cannot feel safe, it cannot burrow. Absolutely ridiculous. It moves on about humidity, it says some tarantulas like things to be humid in their vivariums and should have a relative humidity of 50 to 60%. Some do require more, but it does say, do check your species preference first. All right, so that's fair enough. That's people again having to use their common sense. I get annoyed again. Tarantulas love nothing more than feeding on live insects, crickets, locusts, and mealworms. Insects should be gut loaded for maximum nutritional value. That part's fine. Here, you should feed your tarantula two to three times a week. On the occasion, you could also give them a defrosted frozen rodent. Right. Okay, this is really, really annoying. Now, if I were new, I would follow that to a T. To a, to a Done it again, right? Two or three times a week is bloody ridiculous in certain circumstances. So, let's give you an example here. Let's say I had a juvenile tarantula and I threw in three crickets. We're going to use crickets as an example, yes? He may well eat them all, but if I was to do that every single week, I'm either going to end up with a very obese tarantula that will have a shortened lifespan because of it's constantly digesting food, going into pre molt quicker, um, then it's molting quicker, again, reducing its lifespan each time. The more they eat, the quicker they're gonna go through molts and things like that. The more they eat, 
the more they are going to go through their molt cycle. There are also other factors to take in as well. It's not just about the food. But just as an example, you are going to be lowering your transfer lifespan. But that's not even the worst part. The worst part is if you keep chucking them in three, three crickets a week, if your tarantula goes into pre-malt, it could be in pre-malt for months. It can go without food happily for months if it needed to. You could be keep putting these in and it's refusing the food. The crickets might be hiding away somewhere and slowly that will build up. You might end up having 10 really hungry by this point crickets sat in your tarantula's enclosure without it eating because it's going into pre-malt. What happens after pre-malt? Your tarantula will flip on its back and molt. Now in doing this, the tarantula is highly, highly vulnerable, okay? It's soft bodied underneath. Even its fangs will be soft. It cannot clench into anything. It cannot defend itself properly. And you've got a bunch of hungry crickets running around your vivarium. What are they gonna do? They're going to attack and eat your tarantula. Yes, folks, for those that are new to keeping, this does happen. They should not encourage feeding three times a week as a staple point. Um, they do go to say it needs a water dish and that's cool, right? Because a lot of people, I, I mean, I half expected them to do the sponge trick, which by the way is a no go for anyone that's new. So our tarantula is the right animal for you. Is this animal right for me? We know getting a new animal can be an exciting time, but before you commit, why not take some time to talk through these questions with your family? That sounds pretty good, right? So what are these questions I've got to talk through with my family? Who's the tarantula for? Tarantulas need careful handling and are mainly active at night, so they may not be the right choice for young children. Tarantulas need careful handling. The way they've worded this is awful in my opinion, okay? so. If I were new, they might have meant, they might have meant, be careful if you handle them. That's the way they should have put it. If you handle them. But by saying need careful handling, to me, sounds like I need to handle my tarantula. I've got to do it carefully, but I need to handle that tarantula. Again, what if this person, at the start, remember I said, they're aware that there's tarantulas from all different parts of the world. So they are aware of the more defensive species from Africa or Asia, okay? And they have stated also in this, if it's your first tarantula, so you could be new, or if you've already have tarantulas. So what if you had some old world tarantulas already, you knew very little about them, you picked up this leaflet and now you think, oh, I've got to carefully handle my tarantulas. I've got to handle them. You're gonna get bitten. You're gonna be very, very unwell for quite a while if you get it with the wrong species. So they do not need careful handling pets at home. They do not need handling at all. Some will tolerate you handling them, but they don't need it. Sorry, but this is winding me right up. Right, what's next? Do I have enough space? Tarantulas will eventually need a large vivarium which will take up room. Again, it depends. You could have yourself a little dwarf species. That's never going to take up a lot of room, but that's not really an issue. Can I afford one? That's not really of any importance. It's just talking about the overall expense. Oh, wait, 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 it is. Ready, get this. As well as upfront expense for your tarantula, you will have to think about the extra cost of the vivarium. Food, bedding, <laughs> cleaning supplies, vet care, heating, Right, I could be wrong here, but I don't know any vet that will deal with a tarantula, and I'm pretty sure the pets at home vet section probably don't have a frickin' clue what to do with an unwell tarantula. But bedding? Bedding? It's not a bloody hamster, is it? Jesus Christ. Excuse me, I'm just getting wound up. Uh, and then it says, can I commit to looking after one? And that basically says that females can live for a very long time. So if you end up moving to uni or something, you've got to take that into consideration, which is fair enough. Oh, but it does also say <laughs> after this, uh, you've got to think about changes coming up, how often you go away, who will care for your tarantula if you do, as it's important to interact with the animal every day. Tarantulas can be wonderful companions, but they need a wonderful owner too. They do not need interaction every day. 
It doesn't want interaction every day, it wants to be left alone. You don't go sticking your hands in fish tanks and picking up the fish and talking to them and waving them about, do you? It's a display animal, really. Some of them, you can, you can, you know, interact with a little bit more, but they don't want it. They don't care about it. They might tolerate you. They don't want you interacting with them other than feeding them when they're hungry. It's winding me up because it's dangerous for the animal and for the owner, especially with old world tarantulas, okay? And they're just encouraging this everywhere. So now we're gonna move on to the back. Handle with care. Again, they're using the handling word, which for new people, they may not understand. Many tarantulas are usually good natured creatures. Well, they run off instinct, okay? And they each have their own sort of behavioral traits. Uh, they can be taken out of the vivarium and handled. Again, bringing it up, but you do need to be careful, fair play. Tranches may occasionally bite if they feel stressed and they are venomous. In brackets, it feels like a bee sting. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. You may have some Central American species that if they bite you, your, your only pain's really gonna be the puncture wound, and it probably will come across more like a bee sting as the venom goes into you. You do that with an Asian arboreal, you're going to be very unwell. <laughs> I know people that have been bitten by old world tarantulas and have been very unwell after it. Okay? That's not just going to feel like a bee sting to you. You'd be an idiot to get yourself bitten by them. Or maybe you're not an idiot. Maybe you're just following guides like this. Which has made you make those, those mistakes. It is absolutely ridiculous. They've put no disclaimers on the type of tarantulas that you should be handling, if at all. So, I mean, they could have a lawsuit here, let's be honest. You, you buy another tarantula because this has stated, or if you already own some, so if you bought yourself another tarantula and you ended up being very, very unwell, stomach cramps, vomiting, sweating, going on for days or weeks, and they've just said feels like a bee sting. Come on now. Tarantulas can also flick irritating hairs. They're called urticating hairs for starters. Uh, <laughs> towards threat, which can cause itching again. This is only your American species. This is New World tarantulas. They use the hairs as a first sign of defense normally, which means they're less likely to bite, but that's just less likely. It doesn't mean it won't happen. Your old worlds do not have these urticating, or as they say, irritating hairs meaning they're more likely to jump and bite and ask questions later or run away. It's not all about biting, guys, but it's just if you're brand new and you mess with a tarantula, it is going to want to defend itself, okay? Just like if you messed around with a dog in a bad way and a dog bit you because it was trying to defend itself. It's the same thing. <laughs> Some owners wear eye protection just to be safe. But regular, gentle handling your spider, it will get used to being lifted up. Just be sure to hold them gently but firmly so they can't jump off and hurt themselves. Stop it, pets at home, with encouraging the regular handling. This is ridiculous. Gently but firmly. If you put, if you had a tarantula on you here and you put pressure down on the carapace on the top, it is likely to bite you. Okay, just have them low to the ground, hand to hand, so they can't fall. Okay, they just hit the carpet and you can put a pot over the top of them, right? None of that kind of thing is explained in here whatsoever. And it says, one's company, tarantulas are quite happy by themselves and don't need company. Yeah, exactly. They don't need your company either, folks. Uh, then it tells you about how to sex them through a moat very, very briefly. Um, it doesn't explain how you do it, it just says it can. Um, oh, it does state in here on clean and tidy, take away any uneaten live insects. But if you're throwing three in a week here, yeah, they're going to be able to hide. You want to take them out if the tarantula doesn't eat it right away. You want to throw one in, maybe give it a few minutes, and if it doesn't take to the prey item, then remove it. Not just keep putting them in. Spider poo can be easily spot cleaned and the amount produced is very small if you're not using bioactive substrates you would rarely need to fully clean the spider's vivarium. 
remove and replace the full covering and use reptile safe disinfectant. Yada, yada, yada. Skin deep beauty. Tarantulas will shed their skin from time to time with baby spiders shedding every few weeks in their first year. Not necessarily. Uh, this is perfectly natural and the skin should come off in one piece. Now, it doesn't state in here not to bother them when they're in a molt. It doesn't state in here that as far as I can find yet, what happens when they molt? The fact they flip upside down into new keepers might well think their tarantula is dead. That would have been a vital bit of information to put in something like this. The main risks with tarantulas are the irritating, irritating, hairs and the possibility of being bitten. Teach kids not to put their spider or anything the spider has touched anywhere near their eyes and mouths and certainly no kissing. Children under five, pregnant women and elderly people with weakened immune systems should pay extra attention to hygiene when feeding, handling or cleaning tarantulas. Do not clean their equipment with normal washing up. For starters, a child under five shouldn't be messing around with a, in a tarantula enclosure anyway, in my personal opinion. So how much have we got left here? Because I'm getting fed up. The five welfare needs. A good home. Your tarantula needs a suitable vivarium in which to live. Yes, but you haven't, always, you haven't provided the right way to do that. A healthy diet. The right food for healthy, balanced diet and a fresh water on tap. Yeah. Okay, but not if you're overfeeding it, that's not going to be a good diet, is it? Ways to stay happy. The chance to do what spiders like to do. Exactly, what spiders like to do. That's not being constantly picked up every bloody day, is it? It's not regular handling. That's not what a spider wants to do. The right company. Being with or away from other animals. Well, they don't want to be with anyway, period. All right, unless they're eating them. Help to be healthy. Protection against pain, injury, suffering and disease. I'm not quite sure how they've explained anything apart from how you can potentially cause it pain by constant handling and lack of knowledge of your tarantula. Reptiles, amphibians and invertebrates can make fascinating companions for the right owners, although they might, may require more precise environmental control than other animals do. If their environment and diet are correct, then keeping them happy and healthy is straightforward. If you're thinking of keeping any of these for the first time, speak to one of our pet care advisors. Now I did that! So I went over and I told them that I thought their leaflet was a little bit of a disgrace and what can I do? So the young girl, obviously it's not her fault, she provided me a pen. Scribble over it, she says, and I'll pass it on. So I crossed out a lot of things in here. I've actually left out various other things that I should have read to you here. But anyway, to the point, uh, I, I sat down in Pets at Home for half an hour going through this, writing notes, scribbling things out, and then, because in my guess, I can't prove this, my guess is she would hand it to their manager and the manager will toss it in the bin, right? That's just a guess though. So I thought what I'll do, I'll leave contact details, my phone number and my email address and my name, so that if the manager read it and decided to pass it on, what's the first thing you do for customer satisfaction? Oh, get in contact with that man. A simple message, a voicemail, call, or email would have taken five minutes out of his day or less just to say, thank you, Sam, for your information regarding this leaflet. I am now passing it on to higher management or head office, yada, yada, nothing. Now, I can't prove to you they've done nothing, but it looks like it now. It's been well over a week and in that, it doesn't take that long to send me a message of thanks or a message of get lost, Sam, we don't care. So I reckon it's been flung in the bin. So my next step is to contact head office. I'm going to contact their head office at some point later on today. And I'm going to state my concerns for the welfare of the animals and of the owners of the animals because of their leaflet. And I will make a future update video and I will let you know a, if they even got back in touch with me, and B, if they decide to make any changes. Now again guys, this is all on my personal opinion from my experience in keeping teas. You, some of you out there may think I was overreacting, but honestly, a lot of it was based on the handling section for the safety of the animal and the owner. It's not just about an owner picking up an old world, getting bitten and being unwell. He could have flung that tarantula as a reaction and it could have hit the floor and died. And it's not the animal's fault it was defending itself. There's nothing about different temperaments. 
Now, just because your transfer may tolerate being held one day doesn't mean it could necessarily tolerate being held another day. And it's not just about new world and old world either. I've got over here, Bruce, my G portery, yeah? I could hold Bruce 90% of the time if I chose to. He is a new world tarantula. Down there is my LP. Now remember, an LP was what they were selling. It's a large male LP. In fact, in case you're new here, here's part of a crumpled malt. So you can see there, just on body size, this is without the abdomen, the length of the legs there, he's a big boy. And he's highly defensive. And it's not so much defending his territory, he's really food responsive. Anything touches that substrate, bam, he's on it like a flash. He even managed to take my tongs off me once when I went in to pick up that malt. He took out the tongs and pulled them and I, the weight of him, the strength of him, I even dropped those tongs in there and I had to go and get another pair to get them out because if I put my hands in, he's not trying to hurt me, but he's food responsive. He can sense something in there, bam, he wants to eat. He's got really large fangs, guys. If somebody were to buy that little LP in there and it to grow up and they just thought they can keep handling it, it may turn food responsive like him, somebody's going to get bitten, these guys are going to have a lawsuit on them, yes it's not going to be medically significant but the puncture wounds that that boy could give me would be pretty painful and a little bit more than a bee sting. So I'm going to stop whinging now, it's been a long haul, stressful video, let me know in the comments below what you think, do you think I'm right about these things, do you think I'm seriously overreacting? you guys let me know and if you are brand new here feel free to check out what else dwells within the realm i keep a vast array of different creepy crawlies and i do my best to teach you how to look after them with the knowledge that i've picked up over the past few years not everybody's right about everything but at least i try this pathetic see you later guys take care bye bye